morning, everyone. I'm back. Uh, you may notice that Heidi, our speaker from uh, two weeks ago, is here. And she's here because, as you know, she also has an interest in Cambioradnuk defense, which is why we have Major Kelly Williams. I want to give you a little bit of history about Kelly Williams. He is, obviously, when I say major, it's because he's military. He's been in the Army, and he did does Seaburn in the Army. He came over, he was here at AFIT, at Wright Pat, doing his second and third master's degree. One with AFIT at the base, and one M&I here with uh, Dr. Bigley, you guys may know her. And he, that wasn't enough work for him, he also decided to do our Seaburn certificate. I'm not one to miss an opportunity to recognize talent and exploit it for good, not evil, as many of my students know. And Kelly was a great exception, a uh, great example, not exception, <laughs> <laughs> example of this. Um, he, he's amazing. He knows more about the subject matter than probably anybody else I know. In fact, anytime I have an opportunity to do a, a book chapter or a book or a publication, he's the first one I call because not only does he know the material, he's an excellent writer. And some of you are doing effective science writing with him. So on top of doing his, his normal job, on top of teaching three classes a semester, every semester for us, Kelly is finishing up his PhD. So he's working on his dissertation. So for those of you that feel like maybe cell talks and another class is too much, I want to, you to use him as an example because he is definitely an overachiever. And I respect so respect him so much. I'm really glad that he flew out here today from New Mexico to be with us. Thank you. Well, the, the so the, the key to looking like an overachiever is just to set your initial expectations really low. Um, so above, where seated in his tower, I saw a conquest depicted in his power. There was a sharpened sword above his head that hung there by the thinnest simple thread. So you can't really talk about WMD, of course, without uh, quoting Canterbury Tales, right? Um, There's no way I was going to do this in Middle English, though. So JFK said, every man, woman, and child lives under a nuclear sword of Damocles, hanging by the slenderest of threads, capable of being cut at any moment by accident or miscalculation or madness. So the deal with Sword of Damocles, real quick. Um, so it's an old uh, moral tale where we've got a servant, Damocles, uh, living under uh, Dionysus. And he sees the wealth and the privilege and uh, the lavish lifestyle that the king has. And he says, you know, hey, king, you've got all this. It's so great. You know, that's really what I want to do someday. I want to, like, if I could just come short, I would still be, you know, an amazing guy. And so he's like, well, okay, how about we switch places for the day? And of course, Damocles is like, any one of us is like, yeah, let's do it. Let's, let's swap. Um, so he gets in the throne and he's sitting there getting fed grapes and he looks up and he sees this massive sword hanging over his head, right? Um, and then all of a sudden, the lavishness kind of goes away and he stops caring about that. Now he's just focused on that sword that's pointing down at him. And uh, he expresses his concern uh, to the king and the king's like, well, you know, the, the reason I put that there for you was so that you can get some sense of the imminent peril and danger that is always there for someone that's in power. And so this is where we get that term, uh, with great power comes great responsibility. And so... Uh, I thought that was Spider-Man. <laughs> you know, <laughs> uh, you're, you're right. <laughs> so... Um, when I first saw Sword of Damocles, I started thinking along the lines of um, where JFK eventually went with this. I'm sure it was one of the speechwriters that came up with that, right? But um, so to me, modern civilization is represented in Damocles. And as I see it, the sword is advanced biological sciences, advanced chemistry, uh, nuclear weapons, uh, nuclear power. And, uh, and that's always hanging over our head, right? It can be used for good or evil. In this case, the good was just that it was a reminder for Damocles to get out of that throne. And, uh, you know, with this story, though, everyone kind of focuses on the sword. To me, the hero is the thread. 
Like, we always just look at, you know, how the, the sword's hanging over the head, but uh, in my analogy, the thread would be represented by proper policy, deterrent theory, um, and then, um, you know, I, I would like to say morality of man, but we know that's not really a thing. Um, given a, a good opportunity to do bad things, we'll always uh, tend to choose that route. So that's kind of where I want to take this presentation. So thank you again, Terry, for that great introduction. Um, as a good narcissistic scientist, um, I feel like I should talk about me a little bit real quick um, and, and how I got here as a little perspective for this talk. So the fact that I'm even up here and have like any qualifications to talk to you about Seaburn is kind of an unlikely event because when I was uh, in my bachelor's program at Virginia Tech, I had no interest in chemistry or biology. I almost failed out of chemistry. Um, I just wanted to be a helicopter attack aviation pilot, and so I got an aerospace engineering degree. Almost failed out of chemistry, like I said, but uh, failed my hearing test, so I couldn't be a pilot. So, of course, they put me in heavy artillery to make sure that whatever hearing I had left, they would finish that off. So I did that for six years and then wanted to do something a little bit uh, more with my career. And what more can you do than artillery than weapons of mass destruction? So I uh, started pursuing that, got into that uh, career field a little bit, and then the deeper I went into the science of it, the science is what emerged to me as being the interesting part. And now, of course, it makes sense that I'm an Army scientist doing chemistry and biology for a career, um, and now teaching the Seaburn Defense Program here. So before I get started, I want to kind of survey the room. Uh, how many are the Farm Talk students? Had any m and I? Okay, any military? Just got to find out who my troublemakers are going to be. Okay. So the purpose of this presentation is I'm going to give you a little bit of an overview into weapons of mass destruction and the threats used, uh, the hazard classes used for weapons of mass destruction, uh, some of the challenges that we face now and uh, where I think those challenges are going to go in the future. Um, most importantly, what I'm not going to do is discuss classified information. So if a question comes up that is covered by uh, classification guidelines, I'm going to have to pass. Um, just to make sure that I do that, we've got the FBI here and uh, taking notes, I'm sure. Um, I've got like 80 slides, so it's a, it's a pretty big task. I'm going to skip through some things pretty quickly on purpose. Some things I'm going to slow down and take my time with, and that's on purpose. Um, so you're not going to come out of this talk as being a Seaburn expert, um, and I'm certainly not going to cover all relevant points. So if you have some uh, first-hand knowledge of any of these topics and you'd like to discuss them any more with me, I'm going to have a spot for questions at the end, and I welcome any questions. Um, if you want to know more about uh, Seaburn defense and all these topics, as my shameless plug, uh, go ahead and sign up for the classes as one of your electives. Uh, disclaimer, like I said, I'm not going to discuss classified information, but in addition to that, anything that I say here is my opinion. It's not that of Wright State or the U.S. government or the military. Um, it's just my thoughts. So what is a weapon of mass destruction? I mean, Title 18 of U.S. Code makes it clear, right? It's, there's going to be a test at the end. So uh, in short, a weapon of mass destruction is uh, using chemical, biological, radiological, or explosive hazards as a weapon. So you could take something um, like, uh, well, back when I was a student here, we had a student that was carrying a uh, glass carboy of acetic acid and accidentally dropped it, and so it spread all throughout the, uh, the tunnel. So if that would have been malicious, if it would have been intentional, technically, that could have been charged with use of a WMD, right? Um, not necessarily WMD terrorism, but it could be use of it, you know, use of a chemical in the uh, committal of a crime. So, um, in short, you're using Seaburn, and that's how I'm going to refer to it throughout the presentation Seaburn, chemical, biological, radiological, and nuclear. Um, use of Seaburn hazards as a weapon. Um, I will briefly get into novel 
WMD? Like if I was to ask you if you think that supply chain logistics could be a WMD, you know, what about digital? There's, you know, there's a lot of things that aren't on this Seaburn spectrum specifically that you could argue is really WMD. So just to categorize the talk and our thoughts, I'm going to go through each of these sections. Um, when I get into each of these sections, there's nothing chronological about um, the categories. Uh, that's not like from worst to, to best, anything like that, um, as you'll see. So for chem bio, specifically, not rad or nuke, this is kind of how we think about it. There's a spectrum. There's not like just this type of agent and then just this type and they're separated. There's quite a spectrum and uh, some of the chemicals or biological agents can, can bridge those all the way from the hardcore tried and true chemical weapons, chemical agents on the left over to the bio side on the right. And it's in the middle where things get a little weird. So we've got toxic industrial chemicals, toxic industrial materials, um, like if you know, there's a, um, an ice rink. That ice rink needs ice, needs a cooling system. Um, there's a good chance that they have a couple thousand gallons of anhydrous ammonia outside. You know, that's not a chemical weapon, yet it could be used in that, that sort of uh, case. In the middle, um, I'm not going to get too much with the bioregulators. That's one of those areas I can't talk about a whole lot, um, but there is a lot of um, science that is existing that's been around for decades that we're now taking a second look at. Say, you know, hey, maybe these bioregulators could be a problem. Um, and neurokinins, if you look at substance P, that's something that's widespread in the literature and it's, it's a topic of interest. Toxins, I'll cover briefly, um, but those kind of bridge the gap as well between chemical and biological. Like if it's a chemical that's produced by something that's biological, like where do we put that? You know, in the different uh, international conventions against chemical weapons and biological weapons, like how do you do that? And the answer is just, is just that you put it on both lists. So for chemical agents, this is where I'm going to spend most of my time on purpose um, because these are areas where you probably don't have a lot of experience. Um, if you do, then that's great. Um, if I was to ask you how a bacteria, uh, it's just a general bacteria could affect you, you could probably tell me. If I asked you, you know, what does a virus do to replicate? You know, is a virus alive? You could probably answer those questions. Probably less so for chemical agents. So we're going to go through these. Jumping right into it, nerve agents. Um, I'm just going to talk about general nerve agent activity. Um, briefly, I'm not going to get into specifics about any of the different uh, agents that are already in existence, um, just kind of how these work. So on the, on the science side, um, you know, you've got the, um, the neuron, and it's functioning in cell signaling pathways. The cartoon of it, though, for, uh, for us military types makes it a little bit easier. So the key players um, in this signaling pathway, you've got acetylcholine, which is the signaling molecule, acetylcholinesterase, um, which is, um, of course, an enzyme, but it's kind of the off switch as we think about it. So as a nerve impulse travels down uh, the nerve axon, gets to the synaptic cleft, uh, the signaling molecule, acetylcholine, is released into the cleft. And when acetylcholine is bound to its receptor um, on the postsynaptic cell, then the pathway is opened up, and we just say that that's like the on switch. And it depends on, on where this is happening in the body, whether it's a muscarinic, muscarinic or nicotinic receptor, um, as to what that's going to cause uh, in your body. But in general, this is just a nonspecific reaction, right? So when acetylcholine is bound and the, the light switch is on. Um, very quickly, acetylcholinesterase will come and hydrolyze that molecule and split it, uh, acetylcholine, into acetate and choline, and then it recycles back up into the, the nerve axon um, where it'll get joined back again, and this cycle goes over and over and over. So the, uh, the enzyme acetylcholinesterase will repeat this function, I believe it's on the order of like 50,000 times a second, like it's very fast. Um, but what happens is when you have nerve agent in your system, 
it binds to the active site of acetylcholinesterase, which renders that inhibited. And so now you've got acetylcholinesterase, which is there, it's present, but it can't do its job because the nerve agent is, is bound. Um, and so the, the effect of this is you have a lights are always on situation. So that pathway is always firing, right? So um, I'll, I'll briefly cover the signs and symptoms of nerve agent toxicity, but you'll see I'm, I'm not gonna spend much time there. We'll be here all day. Um, and also I'm not a medical doctor. And so some of you could probably out, out talk me on that. Um, but uh, the thing with nerve agents is there's this phenomenon called aging. So the nerve agent molecule will bind to the active site of acetylcholinesterase. And at some point, there is a leaving group that will leave, since that's what it's doing. And then once it's hydrolyzed, um, it's said to be aged. It's permanently bound. So the nerve agent um, that remains is permanently bound to the active site of acetylcholinesterase and you can't, in some cases, you can no, no longer reactivate that. Um, I'll get a little bit into antidotes, uh, but not a ton. The good news is there are antidotes. Um, if you can get treated quickly, um, you've got atropine, 2-PAM, praldoxime, which is an oxime, to reactivate uh, the enzyme, and then anticonvulsants. So the next three slides are signs and symptoms. Just glance at it quickly. On the military side, we call this uh, sludge, sludge M or sludge dumbbells. So we've got signs and symptoms that cover muscarinic and nicotinic effects, right? There's a lot going on there. A lot, a lot of that's going to kill you. Um, in the end, someone that uh, is going to die from nerve agent poisoning, um, although there's a lot going on there, it ends up being respiratory failure because at some point um, you can no longer uh, breathe. Just all the muscles are locked up, lactic acid is through the roof, um, and, and that's kind of the end of it. All right, jumping into vesicants, blister agents, as you'd see in World War I. Um, I'm going to cover this in just a second, but those of you that have been in my classes know that um, this is mustard gas is kind of a sore spot for me. So before we get into the effects of it, I'd like to tell you how to make it. So this is how you make mustard gas, right? You take mustard, distill it, add sulfur, and in the presence of science, you get mustard gas. Um, that's no more true then mustard is a gas. So I, I probably devote like half of my time when I talk about mustard just trying to overcome the misnomer and the myth that mustard agent, sulfur mustard, distilled mustard uh, is a gas. So I'm gonna do that a little bit here. So this is my soapbox. I promise it's my only one for the day. So please just read that quote like from beginning to end. So I'm not going to name the source that that came from to protect the innocent, but that's what I'm up against. When I'm talking about trying to correct people's notion about mustard agent, um, in no way is it a gas. I mean, just getting into the properties of it, um, first of all, in the environment that we live in, a gas is a gas, right? Of course, you can compress gases into liquids, um, but you wouldn't want to live in that cylinder under those conditions, right? Um, sulfur mustard is a viscous liquid. It's denser than water, um, it's, it's oily, it's uh, pretty persistent in the environment. Um, if rain hits it, it's gonna um, ball up essentially like soap wood um, or water wood and oil. Um, and you can see its temperatures there. So uh, definitely not a gas. And to make it more clear, you guys probably recognize this, right? Um, I've discussed this with like actual scientists and and they would still try to argue that, no, 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 mustard can become a gas. I'm like, yes, but we live in that green band. And so if you're present with mustard when it is a gas, like you're probably not alive anymore. So 
for our purposes, we will call it sulfur mustard, mustard, HD, but um, really just mustard. Okay, so back to it. Um, mustard is a problem, um, and I'll get to the current challenges with mustard, but uh, it's lipophilic. Um, it uh, is a DNA alkylating agent, causes um, ubiquitous problems throughout the body. Uh, it just depends on your route of exposure. Um, primarily, it's a contact and vapor hazard, so eyes, your pulmonary system, and your skin uh, is really where you're going to see the most problems. Of course, visually, um, what gets us is the pictures of people that have been exposed, um, both World War I here, um, you know, more recent pictures of uh, folks in the Iraq-Iran war, uh, where there is a lot of deaths from mustard just due to the, um, the amount that that they're exposed to, but you see the, the massive blisters that are, that are pussing up. Um, emotionally, that's difficult um, to deal with for, for the people around them. Uh, militarily, the idea with mustard was not that it would kill you. It would be that it would incapacitate you and take you out of the fight as a, a combat effective soldier. Um, not only you, because you're covered in this stuff and you're having a difficult time seeing or breathing, but now two or three at a minimum of other soldiers are going to get taken away just to kind of carry you off. And then you burden, you know, up to 12 members of the medical staff, you can see how that would uh, become a problem real fast. Um, in addition, uh, the soldiers that were well that were trying to carry off the wounded soldiers, now they're exposed to direct fire and artillery and all those bad things. So um, it's really effective really bad on mankind, um, just like the rest of these agents, but uh, you know, it's, it's just one of those things. And we're still dealing with it. You can see at the top um, where we are still facing issues with mustard. It's something that uh, until the last you know, five years, we thought that it had kind of gone away um, and that we wouldn't see it again after Iraq and Iran. You know, we, we didn't find the smoking gun in Iraq that they, that they thought they would. Um, this stuff tends to degrade over time as it's sitting in storage. So we're thinking, you know, hey, you know, if, if someone is not making it actively recently, what is still there is probably just a bunch of hazardous chemicals for the most part. Um, turns out that's not always the case. And some of the things that we did find uh, were still about 60% pure. You know, starting from 90 plus, you know, it's still a viable hazard and it's something that we're still having to deal with now. Um, some of my students right now have to deal with this type of stuff during the course of their job uh, in the desert. So, uh, students? right, yeah. So, quick plug on that then. So, um, originally, a lot of the students in the Seaburn program, like myself, um, were in resident students here, um, just getting degrees. And they're like, hey, these look like some pretty cool um, electives, and they would take them. Now, the program has expanded, and we probably have a majority of professional students now that are either with the government, with the military, um, or have clinical duties that expose them to these types of hazards. Um, so current challenges uh, with mustard, I mentioned a couple, but um, with most of these things, the internet has caused a proliferation of knowledge, um, which is great for some things, um, not so great for others. So you can find synthesis methods for a lot of these hazards, uh, especially including mustard, out there on the internet. You don't even have to go to the dark web. You know, these things are just out there. There's patents for a lot of this. Um, and so it's really incumbent on us um, to be forward thinking, coming up with uh, our responses. You know, we've got intelligence apparatus that is like looking out for current threats here, but then uh, clinically and on the research side, like how when this thing happens, can we respond better and, and save lives and reduce injury? Um, but so we know that mustard has been uh, used by ISIS, uh, either by stealing things from, from old stockpiles or by making it in rudimentary ways. Um, the problem with rudimentary, uh, rudimentary is that uh, it's still effective. And it may be effective in a small area, but if we know that there are people out there with the knowledge and the uh, abilities and the resources to do this is something that we need to be thinking about. Um, bad thing is, a lot of the people that are in those areas um, attacked by these things, they're 
completely unprepared. Even if they know what the signs are and what to look out for, they don't necessarily have the resources to, uh, to decontaminate, uh, to treat the, the symptoms and uh, the medical issues that come after an exposure. Um, and so there is that. Um, fortunately, we haven't seen any recent use of mustard outside of that area. Um, it's not something that you need to leave this, this class thinking, you know, hey, maybe I'm going to get get affected by this at some point. Fortunately, that's just not something that we're seeing. Um, so that's great. You can see up there we've got a patent for distilling mustard. So not only can you go find how to make the base product, you can just get on Google Patent and find a way to make it even better. Like, how, how can I take this illegal thing and make it a more harmful product? Um, so while it's, it's bad that that information's out there, that's the way you know, our society is, the information's there. Uh, like NIH grants are never going to be classified, or research under NIH grants sort of thing. Um, in the same way, you, you know what you're up against at least. Um, and I took this screenshot from a YouTube video on how to make one of the immediate uh, precursors for mustard. It's just out there. Uh, so asphyxiants or blood agents. Uh, the term blood agents is used a lot in... Um, in our strategy and policy, but it's not correct. So even though it's called a blood agent, um, the reason that came around was people that were affected by cyanide, specifically, really bright red blood. Um, as I'll show you, that's because their body was not able to utilize the oxygen, so they had highly oxygenated blood. Um, so exposure to cyanide typically comes from uh, inhalation of cyanide vapor or uh, ingestion of cyanide salts, potassium cyanide, sodium cyanide. Um, the Effects tend to occur depending on dose, of course, right? Uh, dose makes the poison, right? Um, within seconds to minutes, and it just depends. Um, generally, if you're alive after 15 minutes, you're probably going to be okay uh, with supportive therapy. But um, I saw a video one time of uh, a group that was exposed to suspected cyanide, and the, um, the medics had these folks outside, and they were administering oxygen to them. It made no sense to me. I know they're just trying to do the best thing, but under the conditions of cyanide poisoning, your body cannot use oxygen. So what is administering more oxygen to them going to do? You know, nothing. Really, um, you just kind of got to wait it out. Uh, there are some treatments, but for the most part, you just have to wait it out. So the key with cyanide is that, like I said, it disrupts the electron uh, uh, well, I'll say electron transport chain, but really it's a trick acid cycle, um, which prevents the utilization of oxygen as the final electron donor. Um, cytochrome, three oxidase, all that. I thought about putting the animation, but we're going to try to keep it at layman's terms because we've got a lot to get through. Um, however, some popular or well-known incidents utilizing cyanide, of course, uh, the Holocaust um, was kind of the key player there with Zyklon B. And um, so, which was hydrogen cyanide, and then again in Jonestown, where there were 907 chemical suicides. That's the where you hear the term "drink the Kool-Aid." That's Jonestown. Don't drink the Kool-Aid. So, cyanide is out there. It's utilized in a lot of commercial industrial processes. Um, it's in natural sources um, like uh, peach pits and apple seeds, and very small amounts. Right? That would not be an efficient way. Uh, if you're a bad person to try to pursue that. Um, it's in uh, bark, or the, the mulch that people put in their yard. That's part of the process for that. Um, but with uh, blood agents, cyanide, we don't really have any emerging concerns. There's nothing that's uh, like telling us, hey, as, as researchers or as, um, as doctors, you should really be watching for these new things with cyanide. It's, it's, uh, it's not in vogue. Choking and pulmonary agents. I'm really just going to focus on chlorine and phosgene. Uh, so chlorine, the picture in the upper left, uh, that's from World War I where they would just set these big chlorine smoke pots out and just open them up and let the wind hopefully blow it towards the enemy. But that was one of the problems is that wind changes. Um, and so the, they did see um, some friendly issues with that. Um, Main issues with uh, chlorine is it's uh, highly soluble, uh, very reactive, of course, chlorine. Um, so you get rapid onset uh, pulmonary irritation, pulmonary edema, 
um, you know when you're in a chlorine cloud immediately um, to the point where it makes you want to run away. That was one of the things with chlorine World War I. They were hoping that the urge to escape the chlorine cloud would be so strong that troops would get up out of the trenches and run, exposing themselves to the direct fire. Yay, mankind, right? So um, chlorine, it's a bad, bad deal, really. What is happening and what's causing all the edema and irritation is it's reacting uh, with your mucous membranes, creating hydrochloric acid. Um, really not a great situation. Uh, so recent issues um, in Syria, um, there's been several. Um, I'll talk about 2014 and 18. Um, so this was kind of the initial, um, uh, let's say that if you remember the red line in the sand, that was not a red line in the sand. Uh, there were you know, chemical attacks against civilians. And each side was saying the other did it. All the countries were saying other countries did it. Um, point fingers in, in all directions. I'm not here to talk about that. Um, to look at attribution. Um, the OPCW did that for me. Um, but you can see in this cloud, um, and this is a screenshot from a YouTube video. Um, if you haven't seen it, it's publicly available. But for a couple seconds, uh, see that inset in the left, you could see the yellow cloud. And that's telltale um, two things. Either it's a yellow smoke grenade, which this was not, um, or it's chlorine. You really don't get that from anything else. Um, on top of that, um, people that were affected in the area said they smelled bleach. Um, there was corrosion on, uh, on copper and metal, which is very uh, common um, with chlorine. And then the signs and, and symptoms of the people that were affected matched chlorine toxicity. Um, if you're watching the uh, mass media at that time, they, there were a lot of reports coming from this area that said, oh, it was nerve agent, oh, it was BZ, it was, you know, all these different things, you know, sarin. Um, but as we saw um, also in 2018, the reports didn't really pan out. And when they actually did the research um, and looked at it holistically, we're still looking at chlorine. Um, and that makes sense because nerve agents are uh, difficult to acquire, difficult to use, um, unless you are a government. Um, that already had them, like Siri did. Um, but uh, let's see, was it March of 19? Yeah, so the OPCW, Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons, um, international group that hates chemical weapons and is really responsible for um, either destruction or uh, neutralization of about 90% of the known chemical weapon stocks at this point. So that's a really good thing. Of the known and identified reported chemical weapon stocks. That disclaimer should always be attached to that. Um, but so in uh, Duma in April of 18, there was another attack and uh, OPCW sent a fact-finding team and it's a huge report and they have staggering evidence like, yes, it was chlorine. There's no evidence of anything else whatsoever. It's just chlorine, um, which is contrary to uh, media reports. Um, a lot of Self-labeled smart people came out and said, hey, I th this was sarin. I know it was sarin. You know, look at, look at the video of that child twitching and foaming. Clearly it's sarin. Like, like I'm not saying that the kid is acting, but you know, still, don't just go off of what you're seeing on, on mass media. Because um, in incidents like this, each side is also wanting to portray a narrative um, that makes the other group look bad. But the scientific report coming out of this with overwhelming forensic evidence was uh, to chlorine. Uh, first of all, you have chlorine cylinders, right? So that's, that's a, a pretty big smoking gun. Um, and they were able to test it. Got it, it's chlorine. So next is phosgene. So I told you that with chlorine, you immediately know that you're in a cloud of chlorine. Uh, it's uh, an immediate irritant because it's uh, highly reactive, highly soluble, and creates that HCL in your mucous membranes. So phosgene, not so much. Um, you kind of smell that, uh, say, freshly mown hay, musty hay. Um, some of the smell references from uh, World War I, which is what this poster is, and also that mustard poster, you can tell that, um, that you know, the culture was a little bit different back then, because not a lot of people here may know what you know, musty hay smells like. 
um, or elderflowers or something, you know. So uh, with phosgene, it's a delayed onset pulmonary edema, and the deal with this is that it's less soluble, it's less reactive, and so it really, uh, first of all, it has to get deep into the lungs, into the alveoli, to have its effect. Um, and so, you, let's say you're out, you know, doing your army thing, there's some clouds roll in, you know, you smell something, but you don't feel anything, so you go about your business. Maybe you stay right where you're at. You continue to breathe, because um, you don't want to go up and get shot. So it's better to breathe whatever you're breathing than to go up and surely get shot. So um, soldiers would sit there and just continue to breathe this. And um, in the midst of battle, they're breathing heavy, so you're not in that uh, shallow tidal volume of breath. You know, they're really breathing deep and getting it down into the alveoli uh, where it has its effect. And then uh, within a couple hours to up to uh, 72 hours in some cases, um, then people start to be coughing, tightness of, uh, in their chest, difficulty breathing, coughing, uh, and then they die essentially of dry land drowning, uh, just like with chlorine. So this uh, chest x-ray shows you a um, uh, large exposure where um, this chest x-ray was taken uh, two hours post-exposure when the patient died uh, after six hours. So that's pretty fast for phosgene, but uh, you know, I'm not an x-ray tech, but that's not, that's not how that should look. Okay. So challenges with pulmonary agents, chlorine and phosgene, um, is that chlorine is ubiquitous. It's everywhere. You can go to any city that has water purification. Um, many industrial processes, uh, um, commercial plants, utilize chlorine in a good way. Um, phosgene also, it's used in a lot of manufacturing processes not as readily available um, as chlorine, but it's still something that has legitimate purposes. So you can't put it on uh, a C chemical warfare um, convention schedule one chemical and say that you can't have any of this because you need it um, in a lot of ways to, to live. Or um, you know, remember I was talking about our modern lifestyle and how that modern lifestyle comes with certain, uh, certain risks. Um, Utilizing extremely hazardous chemicals for beneficial purposes is, is one of those risks. Um, so good news is all you need is a gas mask, right? Everyone's got a gas mask, right? I do. I don't have it on me, right? But um, so the, the countermeasure, the personal protective equipment that's required to protect against these things is very simple. You can, you know, uh, you could get a organic vapor uh, mask from Lowe's or Home Depot for $30, it'll keep you alive. You know, you might want to close your eyes, but, um, you know, it's out there. But do you have it, you know, do you, do you see this threat as being real to you? Probably not, you know, and if you do, do you have it with you all the time? Probably not. So people are still left uh, exposed. Um, and uh, you gotta love the genius of the, uh, the entrepreneur here. Hopefully he's selling those. So, um, lacrimating agents, um, this is really where we get into law enforcement, um, and there's some real issues with this. Um, I'll touch on it and swing back later. So pepper spray and tear gas. Has anyone experienced the joys of, of law enforcement pepper spray, tear gas, okay, Terry, military? Um, I don't know if they made you go through it, FBI training. It's, it's, it's delicious. I put it on my, my hot wings. Um, so it, it's, it's a bad thing. So it's really not even um, CS, which is what we use as a riot control agent. Um, it's not even a gas. They're actually little crystals. Um, and so those little crystals get in your eyes, mucous membrane, cause a lot of aggravation. Um, but the problem is, if you have a bad guy, let's say this is like a, a hostage scenario. Um, hopefully you haven't experienced this or never will. But you have a bad guy. Uh, or a gender non-specific bad person, um, and they have a weapon, and they want to do bad things with it. Um, when you introduce a riot control agent like CS, or pepper spray, you know, which is like, um, you know, like mace on drugs, but you introduce something like that, now you just have a bad guy with a gun, um, still. Like the, the, the presence of the pepper spray or the, that riot control agent doesn't stop them necessarily from doing what they were gonna do. Now they're just mad and their aim's gonna be really bad, right? So um, one of the problems um, is that in such a situation, um, if you were to introduce that and you go in, 
uh, their capabilities might be degraded, but they can still push a button, right? They can still do what they're going to do, um, and that's bad. So I've got a little scenario for you. Um, so what if you could take away the bad guy's ability to act? Like, that would be a good thing, right? If you could just kind of, like, turn off that light switch, and now they're not going to push a button. They don't have, you know, any prefrontal cortex abilities at that point. Um, that would be good if you could just neutralize the situation. But what about the hostages? Because they're in there too, right? So, um, you know, who would do that? Let's say I'm not even going to, you know, talk about you know, what the effects are, but what if you could um, get rid of the bad uh, intent, like who would, who would want to do something like that? I don't know. I would initially be like, yeah, of course. You know, um, if you're altruistic, you say it's for the greater good, right? It's for the greater good. Um, we don't think like that. Other nations, not so much. So we'll, we'll circle back. Incapacitating agents. Um, the only one I'm going to talk about is uh, the code name is BZ. Big chemical name, doesn't matter. Um, but I recommend that you Google it. It's hilarious. Um, you've got um, tests where I used to work um, out at Aberdeen Proving Grounds where you've got these uh, well-trained, experienced soldiers. They're administered this, this uh, incapacitating agent BZ. It's a CNS depressant, uh, essentially. Um, there's, there's just a lot going on with it, glycolate, but um, psychochemical activity. So it's, it's fun to watch because these guys were given this chemical and they're told to do one thing, like take this compass and go give it to your lieutenant 100 meters away. Like, pretty simple, right? Can't do it. They're just like wandering around, looking at trees. This dude's like picking rocks up out of the grass. And then they'll suddenly walk, or they'll stand up straight, start walking like they know what they're doing in a straight line, and then, and then they're just walking around. You know, they're talking to trees, they're pulling bark off of trees. It's, it's an amazing thing. Um, if that hit the street, you, you know, I'm not saying you have to like earn some side hustle money, but that, that could be something to look at. Um, so they're really exposed to this stuff uh, through inhalation, ingestion, absorption, um, especially if you have something that can help permeate the skin barrier like uh, dimethyl sulfoxide, you know, any of those solvents. Um, and so the idea would be that this would have been um, released like all the other chemical agents uh, by ammunition. It would go into a cloud, they'd breathe it, and then they would be wandering the battlefield susceptible to you know, little bits of steel, um, or um, you could take them hostage, you know, not hostage, but you could capture them, now they're prisoners of war. Um, the advantage with this is that compared to mustard, nerve agents, um, which may or may not be persistent in the environment, um, chlorine, phosgene, if you're not there when this goes off, like, it's okay for you. So if you are standing where I want to be, and I don't want you to be there anymore, then I can, uh, you know, use an agent like this, and then I can come occupy that position where you're at, and I'm not now going to be contaminated with mustard or nerve agent, things like that. So it's really good for uh, certain tactical, tactical applications. Okay, that's, I'll leave it uh, at that. But the um, interesting thing is how the affected soldiers, um, on their interview afterwards, they would say that they would go in and out of high levels of consciousness and then just kind of like black out. Like mentally, they're still doing stuff, but they have no memory of it. And that would last um, for several days up to a week. It was really odd, some of those latent effects. So toxins are interesting uh, to me because um, they kind of bridge that chemical and biological gap. Um, but the way that we look at it in, in my field is uh, toxins that are just part of um, nature, like castor beans produce the ricin toxin, the rosary pea produces abrin toxin, um, you know, there's nightshades, and you know, there's a whole lot else out there that we're not discussing. Uh, but we kind of look at these as being on the chemical side, even though, you know, on the policy piece, as far as that string goes. On the policy piece, it covers both chemical and biological um, conventions. But um, just for the ease of it, we look at it as being uh, uh, chemical. But there are um, endotoxins, um, botulinum toxin, you know, is one of the big ones. 
um, where it's produced by a bacteria. Um, anthrax produces uh, two toxins, and that's, that's actually what kills you is the toxins. Um, it's not just the bacteria, it's that, that toxin load. But quickly for um, ricin and abrin, so these are proteinaceous toxins. That's one of the reasons um, we consider them on the chemical side a little bit more. Um, but they do one thing. Those proteins get into your system, and they do one specific thing, and they do it really well. And that's inactivating your ribosomes. So they attack one, uh, one bond in the large subunit of eukaryotic ribosomes. That's it. You know, yet it's a big deal. Um, and it's made its way into you know, popular media with Breaking Bad. Um, there's been incidents in the last few years of people using ricin toxin um, either for hobby's sake, I don't know why you'd want to do that as a hobby, just to, to produce it, um, to extract it really, you're not producing it. Um, but there's been folks that are like involved in nursing home situations um, that have been uh, using ricin. Leave it at that. But, um, the deal with ricin, when someone asks me, like, well, how does ricin kill you? Like, I saw it on Breaking Bad, but, but how does it kill you? The answer is, like, everything. Like, everything in your body just kind of fails. General organ failure. So, you're all smart. You know, you've been through some biochem. You understand biological processes, right? If, if you are inactivating a ribosome, you are no longer making proteins, right? So that's a problem. Every cell is making its own proteins um, ne necessary for life. So everything just kind of starts dying. Everything starts failing. So um, there's not a great way to get around this. Um, but uh, the, the countermeasure is really to monitor, OK, who just bought 100 pounds of castor beans? And then that's where law enforcement will step in. Um, you know, there's export controls and things like that. But you can still just go buy castor beans. Like, that's a thing. I'm not saying anything new. Um, it's out there. But the process of um, trying to use that um, in a malicious way, like if you, if you feed a whole bean to someone, that's use of WMD. Like, one bean. Like, well, it's in a pile of pinto beans. You know, they're not going to notice it. They're not going to taste it. Um, you know, that's still WMD. So that would be a problem for you. Um, the process of trying to extract toxin by using a... Uh, a solvent um, or simply washing them in water and trying to capture that that runoff um, that is in a production of WMD that's a problem for you again um, Abrin similar thing um, if you ever see them they kind of look like ladybugs without the spots uh, they're called rosary peas because um, if you or someone you know is Catholic and they've got um, the prayer beads a lot of times they were used in that um, if your hand is sweaty and it's moist, it can actually extract some of that abrin toxin from uh, the rosary bead, and you can experience um, abrin toxicity just through holding those beans. Same thing with uh, castor beans. Um, I forgot to mention a little bit um, about, about my lab, I'm sorry. So, yeah, in my current job, um, I have a mobile laboratory. We're an ISO 17025 accredited uh, analytical team. Um, and we're one of the few, if not the only, uh, tactical team um, that can test for a ricin toxin. Um, we also have GCMS for semi-volatile chemical analysis, PCR, RT PCR for biological agent analysis, electrochemiluminescence, which is what I use for toxin analysis, um, ricin, botulinum, and SEB. Um, and then we've got a bunch of uh, uh, forensic microscopy techniques using polarized light microscopy, FTIR microscopy, um, and fluorescence microscopy. So, yeah. Anyway, back to it. So, if you have any questions on the technical side uh, with uh, detection or uh, analysis, you know, I can field that. Oh, yeah. Sorry. So, one of the reasons I put Abrin up here, and I never talk about Abrin because it's never been seen in any sort of terrorist plot. It's never been weaponized uh, by anyone to our knowledge. Um, but, um, exception to every rule, in Indonesia in 2019, um, this popped up on my radar that a pro-ISIS group was uh, amassing uh, rosary peas 
with the expressed intent of using it in an Abram bomb. Um, you know, I won't get into the effectiveness of that, but the fact that they had it and that was their intent, we're right back to WMD terrorism. So that was really interesting. And now we know it's on the radar. So they had it, they were acquiring it. Um, we know that that knowledge is out there. Okay, I'm gonna spend a little bit of time here, short slide right here, but I'm gonna spend some time talking about uh, fentanyls and uh, Novichox with big disclaimers. Okay, so I was talking to you about that ability, like what if you could in a hostage situation just turn the lights off on, on the bad guys? And well, what about the effects to the, uh, uh, to the hostages? I was talking about fentanyl and I'm gonna speed up. So briefly, 2002, Chechen rebels take over a, uh, a theater, about 800 hostages, 50 rebels. Um, there's a 57 hour standoff and what ended up happening was uh, to try to save as many people as possible, Russia pumped in um, fentanyl. Um, there's a bunch of derivatives and different types. I'm just gonna say fentanyl. Um, so they pumped it in, everybody went down, just like that. Um, they went down and they stayed down. And then the problem was that, um, you know, of course they were in a, you know, between a rock and a hard place, um, but airway management became an issue. Um, so they thought to themselves, you know, hey, there's different fentanyl compounds, different effects, you know, we could use this. So it, it worked. They saved a whole bunch of people, but all the terrorists died, um, not all of them by fentanyl. Um, but 120 hostages did too. So imagine that in the US where you can get sued for using wrong pronouns. Like if you die because of a law enforcement action, like I, I, would, I would quit right there if I was one of the cops. Um, so it turns out do, uh, dose and route of entry do make uh, a difference, right? So if you are an inhaling fentanyl instead of getting a patch, or instead of getting it IM, like that makes a very big deal, uh, both in the speed of its effect and, and, and what it does to you. Anyway, it just goes um, to show like, well, the, the challenge that comes out of it is, at what point does a law enforcement tool become a chemical weapon? Is it intent? Is it your authority of use? You know, that's on the policy side, um, but it's something that's, uh, it's a hot topic. Okay, Novichok. Um, all I'm going to say, for the sake of time and keeping my job, is um, there's not a lot of official scholarly information on Novichok out there. Um, I can now use that term. Um, before January of 19, I would have lost my job and my security clearance, uh, but we can now say the word Novichok, A-series, fourth gen agent. Um, everything that I can legally tell you is in this uh, link here. OASP is how I'll refer to it, but it comes out with um, the official guidance. I'll talk about Novichok uh, properties in a sec. So I'm not gonna address any questions that aren't covered uh, by that OASP guidance. Okay. Novichok is the newest class of nerve agent. Um, we started learning about it when this guy, Ville, uh, published a book. I say proceed with caution because some of that is in there to sell books and some of that is in there um, uh, and, and is worth our scientific uh, attention. But uh, just because it's in that book and because I have the picture of the book up there doesn't mean that everything in there is correct. Um, however, um, the, the chemicals that are in that book or variants of them are now being added to the uh, Chemical Weapons Convention Schedule of Prohibited Chemicals, uh, if that tells you anything. Um, we'll get right to the case study. So UK 2008, um, two different instances from the same event. Um, so on the left, these are the Screeples. Um, they are Russian uh, dissidents that Russia wanted dead, and that's, that's the going law enforcement theory. If there's something else to it, um, you know, I'm not going to discuss it. 
And this is a picture of kind of that response. So the issue that I want to cover with Novichok is that it is very persistent in the environment. It's like an oil, really low volatility, really low vapor pressure. So think about a drop of motor oil. If you put a drop of motor oil somewhere, at what point does that evaporate? Like at what point does it absorb into the ground? Like, no, it's gonna be oily for damn near ever, right? Um, and so that's the situation with these, is that it's extremely persistent, extremely um, hazardous for cross-contamination. Um, okay, good. So the main thing on the clinical side, which is in the OASP, um, if you have any interest at all in Novichok nerve agents, that's the document um, that you need to look at, that website, and I can put it up there at the end if you like. Um, but, and it goes into specific uh, treatment protocols based on you know, age and weight, all that. I can't cover that because I'm already running out of time. Um, but the one takeaway is atropine. A lot of atropine, like orders of magnitude higher of atropine than you would normally administer. And I, I can't go beyond that. Biological. I know everyone is familiar with what a bacteria is, what a virus is, and, and how they can affect you. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that. Um, but the main things that we are concerned with um, in the weapons of mass destruction community um, are agents that are pathogenic and not necessarily contagious, because then it becomes a me problem as opposed to just an enemy problem. Um, so on the bacteria side, uh, U.S. and other countries have uh, researched and tested and weaponized um, agents. Uh, so the head bullet is the, um, the pathogenesis, the disease name, and then it, its causative agent is below it. So anthrax caused by bacillus anthracis, um, plague, tularemia, brucellosis, and glanders. Um, those are all things that we have weaponized in the past. Our offensive program in the U.S. ended in 1969 uh, when Nixon said, hey, we're not doing this anymore. Um, he made it look like it's because we were like good people. It's because it was way too expensive. The federal budget was like in the 30 million a year, like a lot different than it is today. Um, but at that point, um, they had already in 15 years or so prior to that, this program had spent 30 million and then um, you know, it's, it was really just a cost issue, but it looked good in the media. So pathogenic viruses, uh, smallpox has been eradicated, but, but has it? You know, we, we know that like we've still got research stocks of it out there. Um, it's something that we are still prepared for. It's why I have a scar on my arm. I'm getting vaccinated against it. Um, equine encephalitis, um, you know, it's, it's not contagious which is a good thing. Ebola is, is too lethal, um, and you, so we never wanted to mess with that. Uh, but what about influenza? Obviously, you know, that's, that's becoming a thing. Spanish flu, all right, about a third of the population affected, estimate, um, 1918, about 50 million people died, so more than died in World War I. It's a problem. Um, gotta love science. They recreated it uh, from, um, the bones of uh, some of the people that had died of the Spanish flu were able to get virions out, recreate it, and then test it non-human primates, and they experienced the same signs and symptoms that they would have expected uh, from the 1918 Spanish flu. So um, modern science, again, you know, it's, it's good and it's bad. It just depends on what we do with it. Um, so what's required to be a bioterrorist? Um, of course, this is a joke. Please don't take this as like a lesson to go out and do this. Um, but you know, everything out there is a potential target or vector or host. Um, but my point with this as a challenge um, to modern Seaburn defense is that like we have all this stuff. Like when I was doing my master's here, I was working with a viral hemorrhagic fever virus with dengue. That was my thing. Um, so you need a facility and trained staff. Okay, got it. Um, source material, that's kind of the problem, is you know, coming up with um, that initial seed stock. But then if you are trying to do this on a, on a large scale, you have to be able to scale something up. And that actually is a massive industrial problem. Uh, that you know, It takes more than a, a few undergrads getting together and talking about what they read on, 
online or something. So that's, that's also a problem. That's where uh, policy interdicts and says, hey, if you want to have a 1,000 gallon uh, viral reactor, we're going to have to talk about why you want that thing. You know, if you want to um, have an uh, aerobic fermentation process that's 5,000 gallons, like you better be making a good IPA. Um, anything other than that, like it's not good. Um, and then delivery mechanism, there's also a challenge in that. So the weak links, really, um, source material, scale-up knowledge, um, delivery, not as much. But So that's where policy interdicts. So future challenges, I've talked a little bit about it. Um, but really, it's, we've got synthetic biology as a problem where we can just produce viruses. You know, you, there's the repository for uh, bacterial genomes, viral genomes. You can figure out what's going on with that. And you can reverse engineer these things. Um, designer agents that are uh, tailored specifically to attack a certain uh, codon or a certain sequence. Like if you want to only go after a certain type of you know, person, you know, redheads. You know, I'm gonna, we're going to have a virus that just goes after redheads. You know. Right now it's fiction, um, but that's something that um, was alluded to in Ken Alabeck's book, is that they're looking at designer agents. Um, yeah, move on. So, coronavirus, real quick. Like, I can't even keep up with what's happening on this. Um, I'm already over time. Does anyone have to leave? If you've got to go, I won't be offended, but it will reflect on your grade. No, just, so, um, as fast as I can. So, coronavirus, it's a problem, obviously. Um, I've been watching this since it popped up, and like every day the numbers are going crazy. You know, 2% fatal about at this point. Um, versus the regular uh, seasonal flu, which is 0 .001 fatal, so it's a problem. Um, we're still below Spanish flu levels of about you know 10%. Um, so I say, as far as on the current challenges piece, uh, lies, damn lies in the media. I didn't come up with that; borrowed it from a political pundit. But as soon as information was released by somebody, someone that said that they knew what they were talking about. It was all over the media, and none of it was verified. Oh, oh, it came from the wet market? Got it, okay. Uh, oh, it came from, you know, it was a biological weapon that China unleashed on its own people for population control? Yeah, it, that's out there. Like, all this misinformation, it's all, it's all bad, and we don't know any of it to be true. All we know is people are affected, some people are dying, and it's, it's right on the cusp of uh, pandemic. So we can only deal with you know, what's in front of us, and then the actual scholarly, scholarly literature that's coming out. Um, the way I see it, there's only four possible um, sources of this. It was natural, you know, someone ate that snake. Someone, you know, ate that bat from the wet market. Got it. Um, maybe not super likely. I'm going with lab-acquired infection. You know, if it comes out that it's a lab-acquired infection, whether that was a genetically modified coronavirus or it was just something that was found naturally in the environment that they were working with. Um, that, that's what I'm going with um, because I, I, you know, that happens. We saw potential LAIs in my lab when I was doing a master's here, which is like picking up trash and a pasture pipette comes through. Yeah, and now you got, you know, herpes. So um, anyway, so that's what I'm going with. There's malpractice. So it's known that People working in these Chinese um, research institutes will take the non-human primates, the mice, the rats, whatever, and sell them for m side money on the market. Wuhan Institute of Virology, if you research it, um, they've got a great website. talks about all their coronavirus research in the last few years. You know, I'm like, it blows my mind. Um, it's several blocks from that wet market. So, you know, you can link that together. Um, I say the least likely is malfeasance. I don't think this, personally, I don't see that this was a, a deliberate release of anything. Um, I highly doubt that China would have been modifying coronaviruses with a malicious intent, to, like to weaponize it. I don't think so. I mean, we've got a lot of research going on here. There was a lot of stuff going on um, in other labs and in my lab that you could say, hey, this could be something that you wouldn't want to get out. Um, that's just my thought. So what we see right now is there's a balance between the global economy and the global public health. Like at what point do we really start shutting off supply lines? Um, when do we 
say, hey, we're, we're not going to export this medical equipment because I think we're going to need this. Um, like we're not going to send gowns and masks and antivirals and things like that overseas because we need them here. It's difficult. So that kind of goes back to the other WMD. Like if, if I produce your vaccines and I don't give them to you on purpose, is that WMD? Maybe not in the truest sense, but you can start to see how these global supply chains, like I could intentionally do something to disrupt a market to hurt you. Like if, if your country is affected with this in a bad way, you've got an epidemic, and I intentionally don't send you things that I normally would, that's a, that's a bad thing. Now I don't even have to attack you. That's just nature doing its thing, right? So a lot of thoughts out there on that. Um, I think this is funny, the last bullet. Um, San Francisco uh, yesterday declared a local emergency even though they have no infections. So that's just local. Oh, yeah, so infections are natural, epidemics are political. I think that's very true. Um, almost there. Radiological threats. Uh, so we all know that gamma radiation turns you into like a big superhuman uh, monster, right? Which that's established in science. But um, what we don't know a lot about, dirty bombs, uh, RDDs, radiological dispersal devices. Um, that's kind of a buzzword in the media. Um, it's in a lot of movies and it looks really scary. Um, I recommend that you watch the movie called Dirty War. It's about a uh, dirty bomb in the UK. It's fiction, but it's, it's a good example of what you could expect, Dirty War. Um, you can find it free on YouTube, I think. But anyway, so a RDD, a dirty bomb, is radiological material, radioisotopes that are dispersed um, for our purposes of discussion uh, by conventional explosives. I mean, you could technically, you know, take some and, you know, throw it up in the air. That's not great. Um, but when we're talking about planning for an RDD, it's just some radiological material and a bomb. So the key hazards of an RDD um, is the bomb, right? So you're not so worried about like a little bit of gamma radiation um, if you've got shrapnel and just like cut your legs off. So one of the points for thought is imagine the Boston bombing if they would have had some uh, cesium chloride in there or if they would have had cobalt 60 sources from a gamma knife. Um, in 2014 alone, I'll get to it, but there were um, a good number of incidents where radiological isotopes were just lost or you know, they don't know what happened. Um, on the left here, I've got a gamma knife. That's got 2,000 curies, if you know anything about radiation, 2,000 curies of, uh, from cobalt-60. That's an insane amount of radiation. Um, you know, how's, how's your physical security at the hospitals here? Where you've got, I, I'm sure they've got um, one of those instruments at least. Like, do you have armed guards? Probably not. You can't just walk out with one of those, but it's still, it's still a concern. Um, all I'm going to say with this is there's different types of radiation. So when you hear something about um, a radiation hazard, figure out what type it is. Alpha is going to affect you when it's inside. Uh, beta, gamma, neutron, outside is still a problem. I think I just covered that good enough. Um, main countermeasures to radiation, time distance shielding. Minimize the time you spend in front of a radioactive source. Increase your distance as much as possible. Um, and then try to provide some shielding if you can, that's it. Uh, radiological exposure device. This is kind of like an RDD minus the, uh, the explosives. Good example of an uh, RED is this guy, uh, Litvinenko. Uh, so he was a high level kind of a political assassin for KGB, uh, FSB. Um, didn't like what he was doing, moved to Britain, and then uh, Russia said, you know, we don't need this guy anymore. So they poisoned his tea with polonium-210, um, which you could argue is the most toxic substance that we know of. Um, and over the course of three weeks, he died a slow, agonizing death. He technically died twice. They kept bringing him back um, and eventually um, you know, that was it for him. Um, so you could simply get access to something that is a radiological hazard and expose someone to it. There was an incident um, where there is a, um, I forget the radioisotope, but a radioactive, essential, essentially like a button, like a source that they put in the back of someone's work chair. Like someone tapping their pen on the desk. Like how annoying does that have to be for you to 
want to kill that person with radiation. It's a bad thing. Um, so the ways we get around um, or try to uh, prevent radiological incidents is uh, passive monitoring. So like we, we track sources, we know where they're at. You can actually see them sometimes um, from satellites. Um, there's radiation portals, like when you go to large events, uh, anything with the Secret Service, um, stuff like that where you're walking through what you think is a metal detector. A lot of times there's also a uh, gamma spectroscopy device there where they're seeing if you have anything radioactive on you uh, to the point where if you've had a stress test recently, they'll pick that up. Um, you know, Tech 99 uh, M. Um, and then some stuff like what I do is we do active monitoring where we're walking around in crowds of large people. Um, we call them target rich environments. Um, and we've got monitoring gear where we're trying to see if there's anything hazardous out in the crowd. And if we do, then law enforcement grabs them. Hey, have, have you had any sort of medical procedure lately? Oh, yeah, well, I had a stress test or I'm undergoing some sort of iodine treatment. Um, but so if there's a large group, you can be sure that there are folks, you know, dressed not as nicely as this, but um, walking around and um, testing for, uh, for radiation. Nuclear, not going to get into the, the effects of nuclear weapons, um, anything like that. Just got a couple points for you. Um, is something a nuclear power plant or a nuclear weapon? Well, like I said, it just depends on the speed of that reaction, right? If it is controlled and you can, uh, and that reaction with uh, the fissions is, is critical, then you've got a nice working power plant generating a lot of clean energy. Um, when it's uncontrolled, you get Chernobyl, right? And you go super critical and you can't stop it. Um, similar in some ways, but not the same as uh, nuclear test as Castle Bravo, first thermonuclear test in 54. Uh, um, so the red countries have nuclear weapons. They have nuclear weapon stockpiles, um, according to this uh, open source. Um, people always ask me about Israel. Oh, what about Israel? Do they have nuclear weapons? Like, you know, they show red on some of these charts and they don't show red on some other charts. The official, and this is like, this is the, their official stance, you know, this is to the best of my knowledge, um, fact, their official policy is they're not going to tell you. Like, that's it. And that's a great deterrent uh, position to take. You know, when you think about it, if they say, yeah, we have them, well, now it justifies all the other countries in the region to have them, right? And that's not stable. If they say we don't have them, it makes them look weak. So the official stance on that, um, regardless of what any of these charts will say, the official stance is um, they have a policy of um, uh, they're not going to disclose. And that's the way that is. Um, so then the yellow countries um, have nothing. The orange countries don't have nukes, but we'll loan one to them if they need it. And so, you know, some of the NATO nations where we might have some weapons stored there, we might not. Um, but if you try to attack them, they're kind of under the umbrella. So, fortunately, Antarctica, no nukes. That's great. Um, I was always personally worried about Antarctica becoming a nuclear uh, proliferated state, but not yet. Okay, we're getting to the end. Nuclear challenges. Worst case scenario, in my mind, a terrorist group. Uh, acquires an, a proper nuclear weapon made by a uh, nation state either by stealing it or by buying it. Um, and the issue there is that um, most stockpiles are at least 10 times more powerful than what we used in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, which was, we'll just say, between 10 and 20 kilotons. Um, a lot of weapons in modern stockpiles are in the hundreds of kilotons. Um, Russia, we're talking They've got some megatons. Like, that's, you can't even think about that. Like, it's insane. But if they were to get one and they had the, the proper know how, uh, that becomes what we call, um, on the law enforcement side, an improvised nuclear device where they take a nuke and use it for an unintended purpose. Um, not likely. Most folks don't have the nukes just like sitting around anymore. But after the fall of the Soviet Union, you could just kind of roll up with your pickup truck and grab a nuke. You know, pay off the guards at the door, they don't care. Um, it was really bad. And so there are still some that are missing um, to the last reports that I saw. Um, so that's a problem. Um, so 
emerging nuclear states, uh, Iran, North Korea primarily. Um, I'll, I'll talk about that real briefly. Um, so that's on the nuclear side. On the radiological side, uh, there's still a lot of high-level radioactive waste. There's radioactive sources out there that are unaccounted for. They go missing every year. Um, you can read NRC reports on that, uh, Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Um, so that's, you know, you could be amassing that um, and, and that could be used for nefarious purposes. Um, the way I see it, it's n not great politically for uh, any politician or, uh, or Nevada, but the Yucca Mountain Nuclear Waste Repository, that's really the only way we're going to secure sources and high-level wastes to just bury it in a mountain and, and just leave it there for eternity. Um, probably not going to happen. So North Korea, we know that they've tested at least six weapons with varying degrees of, su of success. They have um, legitimate delivery systems. This is the uh, Waesong 15 as of 2017. It's a massive intercontinental ballistic missile. It can reach the U.S. Um, in, in all estimates. So that's a problem. Um, Nikki Haley, uh, former U.N. ambassador for us, uh, essentially she, uh, she said, we hope we don't go to war, but if they do, they will be done. Like, that's a thing. Um, and I, I believe the same thing about Iran. Um, I think with any nation, regardless of uh, political beliefs, religious ideology, self-preservation is going to prevail, in my mind. Um, like, I might like you, but I don't like you enough where I'm going to let my whole family get killed. Um, if Iran were to go nuclear, um, just like, uh, like, you know, if North, North Korea is different because they already have them, Right, but they haven't used them. Um, if something with Iran was to happen like that, like the Ayatollahs, like everybody, it'd just be gone. And we have a official policy that we reserve the right to use nuclear weapons or um, you know, massive non-nuclear weapons um, in a first use policy. So we don't have to wait for you to attack, we can strike first. That's the thing. Um, the media is focused on Iran's breakout time and a lot of uh, folks um, ask me questions about that. All that means is how much time does it take for you to go from where you're at now to a position where you have a weapon? Um, and that's why the IAEA um, and uh, you know, the, the scientific effort and all the, the monitoring was, was looking at, okay, well, where are they in their um, uranium enrichment? I won't get into that uh, too much, but uh, the, the more enriched you are, then the easier it is to get to a nuclear state. Um, the little pie charts on the side just show how uh, uranium enrichment kind of goes, where you've got a weapons-capable isotope that's in there, but there's not much of it. And when you enrich by separating the usable and the non-usable pieces, um, as the, you see the red getting bigger, that's the enrichment process um, without the science attached to it. Um, so that, that's my thought. So I, I include this picture. Um, I'm a Dinajad, and those are gas centrifuge uranium enrichment um, devices. It, when you have a whole bunch of them, it's called a cascade. Each one does a little bit of work. And then after a long period of time, part of that breakout time, uh, you get what you want out of it. Um, so those are about like maybe seven feet tall, six, six to seven feet tall. Um, and th this is years ago. I mean, things modernized a little bit, but that's the last picture we've got. These are ours at Oak Ridge. Those are tens, I, I won't specify exactly, but those are tens of feet tall. Like, I would say more than 30 feet tall. Um, so when we're looking at programs in perspective, you know, so the breakout time for this, days. Breakout time for this, months or years, right? So that's why we're always kind of like watching that and not wanting them to spin it up. Okay, I went way over on my time, and I apologize for that. Um, it's a big topic. There's a lot I didn't cover, like I said. Uh, but if you want to stay and you have some questions, I'll stay till the questions are done. What do you got? Anything? Yes. Of course. Um, what a great talk. I mean, um, I'm amazed that you were able to get through such a... <laughs> such a large amount of topics. And a reminder to the students, if this 
has piqued your interest, and I, I would be amazed if it didn't. We do have those courses available here, so you might want to consider it. Um, so do you think that uh, the question I have is the, well, actually two questions. Uh, the most important is, so having that one coronavirus facility right there at ground zero to where it happened, you don't think that's just uh, Again, personal view, don't lose my job over it. Um, I do not think that is in any way coincidental. Um, the, so I, I've been through uh, Wuhan Institute of Virology's site. I've looked at several um, um, of their papers, and they were doing research related to exactly what happened. They were looking at... Um, modifications in the coronavirus genome. They were looking at inserts. They were looking at um, ways that it could jump between species where we hadn't seen it before. So the, what struck my mind, because I, I knew a little bit about uh, coronavirus already, thank you, Dr. Woolley, um, was um, it typically infects like um, civets and birds. And they were like, oh yeah, it came, or I'm sorry, uh, bats. And they're like, oh yeah, it came from a snake. I was like, okay, Let's, let's look at viruses that can adapt to be pathogenic in both warm-blooded and cold-blooded animals. Like, that's, that's significant. So that kind of struck me as interesting. Not that it couldn't happen, but it was just interesting. Um, and then so I started researching uh, Wuhan Institute of Virology. Um, and then after I started reading those uh, research papers, I'm like, wow, they are looking at, you know, natural... Modific well, if there were unnatural, like uh, inserted modifications to the genome, um, they, certain they certainly weren't publishing it, right? It's, it's a communist country. They're only going to put out what they feel like. They're not required to publish everything um, like we are if you're under NIH grant. To be traceable to it. Yeah, so they're working that. Um, there is a paper. It's, it's under peer review right now, um, so I can't show it to you. But I've corresponded with the author uh, last week. Um, out of India, great research. Um, they got the, um, so the sequence for uh, COVID-19 was published a couple weeks ago. <clears throat> um, they took that and looked, they were just comparing genomes. There are four inserts in COVID-19 that are not present in any other coronavirus that's been sequenced. Those four inserts, HIV-1. Like, that, that's not fortuitous. Like, you can't expect something like that to happen. Like, you know, I talked to some of my coworkers, like, well, what if someone was infected with the COVID-19 and um, they were also HIV positive? Like, would that produce, you know, and then they become pathogenic and they spread that? Like, I'm, I'm not a virologist and I don't, I don't do that type of work, but... If you look at the probabilities of each one of those things being successful, um, like I would say no. So the other question is, three or four months from now when we see you, do we refer to you as major doctor? Oh, so, so there. Doctor major. Well, so it depends. Like, um, so it is. It's March of 21. So I, I still got about a year. Um, but I think major doctor would probably be. Yeah. Just to annoy the doctors that I work with. Uh, yeah. The rest of us minor doctors. <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> you guys actually do the stuff, you know. I, I dabble. Thank you for the uh, Two big questions. First one, can carbon monoxide be weaponized as quick can be on the blood oxygen at the Can, I didn't hear that part. Can what be yeah. Can carbon monoxide be weaponized as so I would say absolutely. You know, we talked about ticks and tims, toxic industrial chemicals, things that have, you know, uh, legitimate uses. Um, anything that is available to you that can hurt people can be weaponized. The problem with carbon monoxide, um, and that's a great one, um, is that uh, Boyle's Law, you know, it's going to expand. So, okay, I'm not trying to... G I'm not trying to give anyone an idea of like something to do, but that's, that's the realm that I work in. I have to always think like the bad guy so that we can try to, you know, predict and come up with countermeasures and things like that. Um, if I was a bad person and I wanted to like hurt people, you know, yes, you can 
put carbon monoxide into an enclosed space, um, and then of course you're, I mean, that's, you know, a lot of, a lot of folks commit suicide like that. You know, they just get in the car, start it, that's it. Um, and you can come back from carbon monoxide poisoning, you know, but you have to recognize the signs and symptoms. You have to, um, let's see, the paramedics would have to, I, I think paramedics would be able to recognize signs and symptoms um, if people were still lucid but, um, or conscious, but then you'd need to like measure carboxy hemoglobin counts, you know, like, and or the, was it, um, instead of oxygen saturation, is it carboxy hemoglobin saturation? I forget. I'm not a medical doctor. Um, Sure. So that's a that's a big question. Um, I'll answer it as concisely as I can. So, uh, for the answer is it depends. Uh, that's that's my cop out for like everything. So you mentioned you, you cover nerve agents and biological and radiological nuclear hazards. So f medical facilities that are near research institutes, near government stockpiles of things. Um, they are part of an emergency response program and they know that hazards near them, if they you know, fall into that plume of a potential release or something like that, they know that they need to have uh, 2-pam chloride, atropine, um, um, anticonvulsants, things like that. Um, whereas if you're in a rural, rural area or you're a medical facility that has no reason to believe that you know, the nerve agents are around, you, you probably aren't going to have a lot of that. Um, probably atropine sulfate, yeah, but not to the levels that we're talking about. Again, read OASP um, for, for the guidance, but massive amounts of atropine. Okay, so yeah, that's it, massive amounts. So um, for biologicals, fortunately, um, unless a uh, bacteria, let's just talk about bacteria, unless it has acquired um, antibiotic resistance or something like that, either accidentally or maliciously by sharing plasmids. Um, most of the antibiotics that we have will be okay. Um, you might get, get smashed by the amount that they'll give you, uh, but plague, anthrax, uh, tularemia, for the most part, all of those can be treated with modern antibiotics that every hospital is going to have. Um, so radiological, not as much. Um, that's, that's a more difficult one to, to deal with. Dr. Lucott? Yes. You're the last one, and then we'll, we'll dismiss everyone. Just about another show. Another show for a very well described in the movie, The Son of All Fears, about 10 years before that book came out. And you know, okay, I want to talk about it this year. What, what's the thinking behind that? I can't say. <laughs> Sorry, not, not trying to sound secretive, but you know, that's, that's, yeah. I mean, the book was published way back. He, um, he had publications in Russian in 99, but you know, the government is a, is a slow moving wheel. So, yeah. Thank you very much. Um, the thank you. Wants to give you this chart. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your extra time. I'm sorry I went over. I, I thought I wouldn't be able to fill the time and it you know, went way over. <laughs>